US News put out this article on what they call the seven best dividend paying ETFs that you can consider buying. Here are the seven ETFs that they recommend. And again, investing has risks. Make sure you always do your own due diligence and never blindly blindly follow a random guy on YouTube. Number one, SCHD, which is paying out 3.6% a year in dividends. VYM, paying out 3% a year in dividends. HDV, paying out 3.8% in dividends. VYMI, paying out 4.4% in dividends. SPHD, paying out 4% in dividends. LVHI, paying out 7.3% a year in dividends. SPYD, paying out 4.5% in dividends. Now, as a disclaimer, every one of these with an asterisk, the first four that I mentioned are dividend-paying ETFs that I am personally invested in. Again, do your own due diligence. So now, what does this mean? You can build systems where every week, every month, every whatever, two weeks, you have cash that leaves your bank account and it can be invested into a portfolio of ETFs. It doesn't have to be these dividend paying ETFs. It doesn't even have to be dividend paying ETFs, but you can pick some investments that you want to own. And now every time you get paid, a piece of your money is automatically going to be invested. And the way that you win in this game, especially in the cash flow game, is you stay consistent and you do it for the long term. Because now when you hear that a investment, an ETF is paying out, 4% a year in dividends, it's not a lot of money. Because now if you invest $100, that's $4 a year in cash flow. But if you invest $100 a week, every week for 10 years, now that starts to add up, especially when every time you buy, you're getting $4 of cash flow, and then you use the cash flow that you're getting to buy more cash flow. If you stick with it and you stay consistent and you keep reinvesting your profits, well, in 10 years, you are going to surprise yourself. And you might be thinking, but Jaspreet, I don't want to wait 10 years before I can start using this cash flow. I want to have it today. Well, two things. Number one, building wealth is not an overnight game. And when you try to make it an overnight game, well, you end up losing a lot of money to people selling you a whole bunch of get-rich-quick services. So I want you to understand that. And number two, you can, yes, you can amplify and shorten the amount of time it takes for you to become wealthy, that that's going to require you to earn more money. Now, how do you earn more money? Well, you can earn more money from a job or you can earn to earn more money from building your own business. If you can build your own business, there's no limit to how much money you can earn if you can sell more stuff. But again, it, it comes back to now wealth is built through owning investments. It's through owning assets. What type of assets do you want to own? Do you want to own assets that will hopefully grow in value, or do you want to own assets that will pay you with cash flow? If they pay you with cash flow, it's a much more slower producing game. That's just the way that it works. When you invest in real estate for cash flow, you're not going to get a 50% cash and cash return on your money, or you're probably not going to. So you're going to get a slower return. Like for me, what I would consider a good return, when I go out and invest in real estate, I'm looking for a 7% cash on cash return. So when I invest $100, I want $7 of cash flow after my expenses. If I invest $100,000, I want $7,000 a year of cash flow after my expenses. So it's a very slow game. But if you can have more money and you keep taking this more money and you keep using this more money to go out and buy more of these cash flow producing things, if you stick with it, well, you're going to keep amplifying and growing the amount of cash flow. So you got to understand the game. First, you got to get the money. I'm not talking about how do you get that money today. There's a lot of ways you can get the money. You can do it from your own business. You can do it from your job. You can do it however you want. You got to get the money. And it doesn't take a special degree, a special way you look, a special anything to get that money. But it does take the hustle. It takes the risk tolerance. It takes the ability to learn. And it takes the ability to fail. If you have these things, you can go out and get the money. Once you get the money, the question is, what do you do with the money? You can spend all that money and be broke tomorrow. You can save all that money and be broke at some point in the future where you can invest this money and work to build that future wealth. Now, when you invest this money, you can either be an appreciation investor, a cash flow investor, or a hybrid of both. I'm a hybrid of both, but I prefer cash flow generally. When you invest for appreciation, you're speculating. There's no guarantee that something's going to ever pay you in the future, but 
If it grows, you can see a lot of returns and you can also get some tax benefits because you don't actually pay any taxes until you ultimately sell. When you get cash flow, you get a little bit more of a guaranteed payment, but it's much slower. So now when you're working to invest in cash flow, that's when you can decide how do you want to generate that cash flow? And right now I've been focusing on real estate and stocks. There's a third way that you can generate cash flow, which I want to highlight in just a minute. But now you can start investing in real estate and stocks. Real estate is going to take you more money to get started. Real estate has bigger and better tax benefits, but it's more involved. You got to spend more time. You got to spend more effort, and it's going to take more capital to get started. In stocks, it's much more passive to generate cash flow from stocks. Much less work and much less money required to start generating cash flow from stocks, and much less maintenance and oversight to do that. Anybody can start doing it with as little as $100. But the key with no matter what you do is you got to stay consistent. This is not something where you work to save money, you invest it once, and now you have enough cash flow to live your life. Or at least for 99.9% .9 of people, that's not how it's going to work. But you have to now work to accumulate this money. That way you can go out and start buying these assets. And then that's where you can make the decision. Do you want the cash flow or do you want the net worth? I like the cash flow. That's the way that my brain works because now I can just work to stack the cash flow and this is where now I know how big I can live. I can live as big as my cash flow because when my cash flow is growing, I can go out and spend more money because now I know that if I spend all my money today, I'm going to get more cash flow checks next month. Now, this brings me to the third way that you can start generating the cash flow, which is the most difficult way to do it. And that's why I saved it for here because... If I say, when I talk about this, everyone's going to say, oh, but just breathe, not everybody can do that. And it's very difficult. Well, there is a third way. And this is going to be reserved for entrepreneurs, people who really want to build a business. The third way that you can generate cash flow is you can work to build or buy a business that you don't have to work in. And the way that it works now is you get paid the profit, but not a salary. And if you are able to build a business, where you can pull yourself out of, meaning you can hire a CEO to run the company. Now, the business can run as normal. The CEO will hopefully, if you structure it correctly, be incentivized to grow the revenue and grow the profits if they're getting a salary and either ownership or a piece of the profits. They'll be incentivized to do this. Now, your business is a machine that's working to produce more money. And where does that money go? The money doesn't go to the CEO. The money doesn't go to the, the employees, although they are the first to get paid. The money goes to the owner or the owners. And in this case, that's you. And so this is where you have to understand a little bit of corporate governance to really understand the way that this works. I'm going to jump back into the video in just one second. But before we do, if you are an investor and you're looking for an easy and free way to stay up to date on what's happening in the top financial news from the economy to the housing market, to the stock market, to the crypto market, to the global economy, then you have to check out Market Briefs. Market Briefs is my free financial newsletter that I created that will keep you up to date on what's happening in the financial news. You can read the newsletter in less than five minutes every morning. It's the fun and easy to read email and it's completely free. So if you haven't joined Market Briefs yet, I got the link to how you can join down in the description below. When you go out and start a company, the first person that's going to get paid, assuming you don't have any debt and all that other stuff, is going to be the employees. It's probably not even going to be the CEO because now you have to make sure that your employees get paid because if you started a company and you're the CEO, well, if your employees are not getting paid, they're going to leave way before you do. So you got to make sure the employees get paid. You got to make enough money to pay the employees. Then when you have enough money coming in to pay the employees that you can take out a salary too, now you're working to make money for the employees and to pay your salary. Then if the business can continue to grow, the business is going to start making a profit. And this is where now obviously you can do a few things with that profit. You can take that profit and save it. That way your business can build a big savings account for a rainy day. Your business can take this profit and reinvest it back into the company. That way they can grow bigger. Or this business can make a profit and you as the owner can take this profit money out and go out and buy a nice car or do whatever it is that you want with it. And if you can continue to grow to a business that doesn't require you, now you can go out and hire a CEO. Pay them a fair CEO salary, which is going to be a lot, and incentivize them to continue building and growing the company. Now this is a lot easier said than done. But if you are able to build a business that does this, 
Now you have a cash flow producing business because once you step away, the CEO is now in charge. You have fired yourself, brought in a new CEO. You still own the business. You own the equity. Well, who gets paid first? The employees get paid. The CEO gets paid. The equity owners get paid last because now as the equity owner, you get paid with profit and you are the last person to get paid. And this isn't just me saying this. This is legally the last person to get paid because if your business goes into bankruptcy, the equity owners, the shareholders, the investors are the last people to make a penny. And most of the time, you're not going to make any money if your business goes into bankruptcy. So now when you are the owner, if you can build a business, the employees get paid, the contracts get paid, the bets and the debts get paid. But if there's money left in the bank account, that profit, that is your cash flow that now you can use to live your life. It is not easy to do this, but it is possible. And it's another way for you to generate cash flow. So you can generate cash flow from businesses. You can do this by building a business. You can do this by buying another business, but that's going to take even more money because if you want to buy a business this big that's producing enough cash flow that it doesn't need you, it's going to cost a lot more, likely $5 million and up, if not more but it's going to be a multi-million dollar purchase for you to go out and buy a business that doesn't need you. You can go out and buy real estate or you can go out and start investing in stocks. And so now depending on how much money you have access to, it's just where do you get started? Now, if you want to do more, you got to earn more. And that's a whole different skill set of how do you earn more money? There's a bunch of videos on YouTube that will go over how you can start attracting more money. And then the question is, what do you do with this more money? And the biggest mistake that everybody, not every 99% of people make, 99.9% .9 of people make, is as soon as they start making more money, they start living a bigger lifestyle. But if you really, really, really want to become wealthy, you got to understand why are you working to earn more money? You got to work to earn more money to buy more assets. And in this game, in this video, it's buy more cash flow. You're working to earn more money to buy more cash flow producing assets because now this cash flow will determine how big you will live. You want to buy a nice car? You want to go on nice vacations? Great. No problem. Just make sure your assets can pay for it for you. There are four different categories of assets that you can consider converting your money to. That way, now not only can you protect your money against high inflation, but you can also benefit from inflation. Number one is by investing your money into your own income. Number two is by investing your money into passive assets. Number three is by investing your money into more of active assets. And number four is by investing your money into more of protectionary assets. Let me start by talking about investing your money into your income. Your income and your expenses will ultimately determine how much money you have left over to be able to invest in other assets. And for this particular income topic, I'm not talking about the income you get from your own business, but if you're working a job, meaning you're working inside of somebody else's asset, because if you're an employee in a business, well, somebody owns that business, that's an asset for them, but you are a piece of that business. Now, the first thing you want to do is you want to make sure that you are a valuable part of the business. You want to make sure if you are an employee that you're able to succeed and do well as an employee, because if you do well as an employee, you're going to be the one that can get the most raises, the most promotions, the most bonuses. You want to make sure that obviously you are working somewhere where you have the ability to succeed and see more of that upside. So you want to be working to invest in your income. How can you increase your income? Now, this might be you going out and getting a certificate if you're not happy in the career that you're in. This might be you working to get a promotion or to get a raise. This might be you working a second job that we can earn more income. Or this might be you working more on a commission basis where now you have the ability to earn more money if you put in more work, something like a sales position, because now you're working not to go out and buy a car. This is the mistake that the majority of Americans make is that they work to buy things and then they work harder. They work harder to get a raise that way they can buy even nicer things. When the majority of Americans go out and get a raise, they have to show it off with a new car or they have to show it off with a vacation or they have to show it off with a bigger home. That is a guaranteed route to being broke. So what you need to do now is number one, invest in your own income, work to earn more money. And the reason why you want to work to earn more money is so you can have more assets. The reason why you have more assets is because your assets are what will actually make you wealthy. Your savings are not there to make you wealthy. Your savings are there to protect you against an emergency, or you can use your savings to go out and buy investments, buy assets at a discount price, or just buy assets in general. You're saving money to buy assets or you're saving money to protect you. You should not be saving your money to become wealthy. That's not what your savings are there for. So now 
when you're working to earn more money, what's the reason why you're working to earn more money? It's so you can buy more assets. Because now if you can buy more assets, you can buy more investments, you can create more cash flow, or you can have more wealth, which will then be able to fund more of your lifestyle. So if you want to have a bigger lifestyle, great. I want you to have the nice things. But you want to make sure you can do it the right way. Most people make money to buy nice things and then wonder why they're always broke. Wealthy people make money to buy assets and then let their assets pay for the nice things. And then they never have to worry about money because they own the assets which continue to produce an income for them even when they're not working. The second type of asset that you want to own to protect you against inflation are passive assets. Now, the thing that I want you to understand here is that inflation can be a double-edged sword because on one hand, when you have low to moderate amounts of inflation, that causes the price of assets, things like stocks and real estate to grow because, well, when you have inflation, that means people have to pay more money for rent. That means people have to pay more money for their groceries, they have to pay more money for their things, which means that these businesses and the landlords make more money. So on one hand, and the low and moderate inflation, that benefits the asset owner. But then when you have too much inflation, that comes back around to bite you because then if you have too much inflation, that means that people no longer have the ability to spend because they have to pay so much money for their rent. They have to pay so much money for their groceries and their gas and their travel that now they have limited leftover money. And when people have limited leftover money, that can then contribute to an economic slowdown or a recession, which then hurts asset prices. So you have to understand that Inflation, in general, is good for assets, things like stocks and things like real estate. But when you have too much inflation, that can come back around to then hurt those same assets. But understand that, in general, inflation is good for these assets. So I want you to understand that, and nothing works in a vacuum. Nothing goes up or down linearly just based off of one other factor. There are so many factors that impact the prices of things. Investing has risks. You are never guaranteed to make money when you invest. In fact, you will probably lose money, so make sure you always do your own due diligence. And never blindly trust a random guy on YouTube. Now, the two main types of passive assets that I want to go over are stocks and real estate. Stocks are much more accessible for people. Real estate is less accessible. It takes more money. It takes more time. It takes more capital. It's fair. It's just the way that it is. Now, you can do one or the other regardless of where you are. You just have to set your mind to whatever it is that you want to do. So I want to start by talking about stocks as a passive investor, and then I'm going to talk about real estate. Now, when I say passive investor, the reason why I'm saying it this way is because this is not something that you really are building yourself. Now, of course, if you are a real estate investor, you can be actively involved as a real estate investor, but it's still considered a passive investment. Even in the stock market, you could be a full-time stock market investor, but you're not the CEO of the companies that you're managing. You're managing your investments. You're not managing the operations. And so when I talk about being a passive investor, I'm talking just broadly stocks and real estate. I know that I talk about being an active investor in real estate and stocks, and I talk about how I'm an active investor in real estate and stocks, but that's not what I'm talking about here. When I talk about being an active investor in this video, I'm talking about managing the actual operations of that entity. And for this purpose, I'm going to be talking about your own business. But when I talk about passive assets today, I'm talking about stocks and real estate on a broad level. Now, there are a lot of different ways you can invest in stocks, for the purposes of this video, I'm going to be focusing on more of the passive side, investing in funds, because when you invest in the stock market, most people think that the way that you win is by finding the next Amazon or by finding the next Google or by finding the next Apple. But very, 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 very few people are going to be able to do that. Very few people are going to have the psychology to be able to hold on to an investment in the early stage through all the downturns and continue to hold on to it and make investments into it. Very few people are going to have the financial IQ to want to research these companies. And very few people are going to want to go through that type of roller coaster. Investing in individual companies is difficult. It takes work. It takes research. And it does take a little bit of luck too. But the alternative for 90 to 95, maybe even 98% of people is to invest in funds, which are now a group of companies. Because the reality is most people lose money in the stock market. But if you look historically, the stock market has gone up by 7 to 10% a year on average over the last century. Now, that doesn't mean the stock market always goes up, but historically, over the long term, the stock market has gone up pretty consistently. 
Yet we keep hearing about people who hate the stock market because they keep losing money in the market against these big players. Why does that happen? Because people are trying to find the next big thing. They become traders or they just don't know how to manage the psychology of their investments. If you want to win in the stock market, the simplest way to do that, not the easiest, but the simplest way to do that is to invest in low cost funds, whether it's an ETF or index fund that give you broad exposure to the economy or to the stock market. Keep investing your money into it every week, every two weeks or every month. And you do this for a long time. And when I say long time, I don't mean six months. I mean years or decades. If you do that now, you're essentially just buying a piece of the American economy. And when you're buying a piece of the American economy, well, if the economy continues to grow, your investments will continue to grow. So this is where now just understanding the different ways that you can invest your money into these types of passive investments. That way you can get exposure to this types of wealth. Now I'm going to go over a few different types of ETFs that you can consider investing your money in. I'm not recommending any of these. Do your own research before you make any investment. I am not a licensed financial advisor. I'm just a random guy on YouTube. So do your research before you start investing into anything. But let me go over a few different examples. A few examples of ETFs that you can consider investing in are VTI, SPY, DIA, and SCHD. And as a little disclaimer, I personally am invested in SCHD. VTI is an ETF that gives you exposure to the total stock market. What does that mean? Instead of you going out and investing in every stock on the US stock market, all the major stocks, now you can invest in this one ticker symbol, VTI, and you're gonna get broad exposure to the general stock market. Now you don't have to go out and invest in all these companies and keep up with every single company. You invest in the one ticker symbol, and now you're getting exposure to essentially the United States economy. SPY gives you exposure to the S&P 500. The S&P 500 is one of the longest tracked indexes. It is the 500 largest companies on the stock market. So now, if you said, I don't want to invest in everything, I just want to invest in the big companies. Well, SPY is one ETF that will give you exposure to the 500 biggest companies on the stock market. Now you're investing in the big companies that make America, America, and you don't have to keep up with all 500 of these companies. You just put your money into the fund, and now you're getting exposure to the big companies in America. DIA gives you exposure to the Dow Jones Industrial Average. The Dow Jones Industrial Average is, again, a very popular index, meaning group of companies. This is made up of 30 different companies on the stock market, some of the biggest and most well-known companies on the stock market in different indexes. Now, again, the Dow Jones is one of the most tracked and most talked about indexes. And instead of you going out and investing in each individual company, you can invest in this one ETF and get exposure to the Dow Jones and now own a piece of the Dow Jones. SCHD is a dividend paying ETF, meaning this is an ETF that people invest in for the sole purpose of investing in high dividend paying companies. What are dividends? Dividends are cash flow. This is when a company will pay you every three months for doing nothing except owning that stock. So now when you go out and invest in something like SCHD, now again, you're working to create that income. You're working to create that cash flow. Now, when you go out and you hear an ETF where a stock is paying out a 4% dividend, that might not seem like a lot of money because if you invest $100, it's only $4 of cash flow that you're going to get over the course of a year. If you invested $100,000, you're only going to get $4,000 worth of cash flow. If you invested a million dollars, you're getting $40,000 a year of cash flow. And that discourages a lot of people. But the way that you win in this cash flow game through your investments is not by making a one-time investment. It's by investing a little bit of money every time you get paid, whether it's every week, every two weeks, or every month. I personally love investing for cash flow and the way that it works for me in the stock market is I'm investing every week into my dividend paying ETFs. Every week I'm throwing more money into these ETFs, into these assets, and then every three months they're throwing more money at me. Now every quarter when I get my dividend payout, the amount of dividends that I'm getting is growing because for one, I'm investing more money into these dividends. Like every week I'm putting more money in there. But then number two, every time I get paid with my dividends, I'm taking this cash flow that I'm getting and I'm using it to buy more of these assets. So I'm just working to continue growing the amount of cash flow that I can get because I just want to own more of the assets. So now, what am I doing in this game? I'm working to just build and stack up the cash flow. This is one way that you can start investing your money in a passive way that you can get exposure to the United States economy 
without having to go out and research individual companies, without taking on all the risk, without spending all the time, without having to learn about how to analyze companies. It's a simple way for you to start doing this. And there are brokerages out there, stock brokerages out there that specialize in this type of passive investing. The next way that you can invest passively is real estate. And the reason why I like real estate so much is a couple of reasons. Number one, I can create cash flow. Number two, you get tax breaks when you invest in real estate. But then number three, more particularly for the topic of this video, you own a hard asset. Because when you invest in real estate, you own something that you can see, feel, and touch which creates a lot more power and a lot more opportunity, especially if you're worried about the health of the United States dollar. Owning real estate gives you something real, gives you something tangible. And if we just talked about the worst case scenario, let's just say the dollars went down the drain. People stopped caring about the value of the dollar. Well, if you own real estate and your tenants have to pay you rent and you don't want dollars, you can have them pay you in chicken eggs or duck eggs or whatever it is that you want because you own the asset and now you can get paid however it is that you want. Now, going back to the topic of real estate, the way that it works is you're going to go out and buy a property, whether it's a condo, whether it's a single family home, whether it's an apartment complex, whether it's a duplex, whether it's an office building, whether it's a retail building, whether it's a mobile home park, whether it's a storage facility, whether it's something else, a mixed use building or anything. Your goal is to buy this property, not so you can flip it. That's what flippers do. What I'm talking about investing is not flipping. I'm talking about accumulating assets, owning real estate, playing the game of Monopoly. That way now you can collect rent. Every first of the month, you get a new rent check comes in. And if you do it correctly, this rent check should cover all of your expenses, your property taxes, your insurance, your maintenance fees, your management fees, your vacancy fees, and everything in between. And then put some money in your pocket even after paying your mortgage payment. That is the right way to do real estate. That's the way that I invest in real estate. Now, when you do it this way and you do it correctly, not only do you create cash flow that can be passive. It's not completely passive, but it can be generally passive if you have a good management team. But now you also can get access to a lot of tax breaks because as an attorney who's not your attorney, I can tell you that real estate has some of the best tax breaks that our tax code has to offer. These tax breaks can allow you to earn money and pay little to no money in taxes every month legally and they can also allow you to make a lot of money on your real estate gains, meaning you buy a property for $100,000, sell it for $200,000, and pay no money on that profit today if you use that $200,000 that you just got from the sale of your property to go out and buy a bigger property. This is called a 1031 exchange. There's a lot of tax breaks that the real estate tax code offers and that's why wealthy people love investing in real estate. So there's a lot of benefits to being a real estate investor. And when I say being a real estate investor, that does not mean going out and buying a big home for yourself to live in. This means you going out and buying real estate for other people to live in. And yes, it is difficult. Yes, it takes more money. But if you dedicate yourself, you say that you want to be a real estate investor, I can guarantee that no matter where you are financially, if you dedicate yourself to being a real estate investor, a number of years from now, you will be able to go out and buy your first rental property. If you dedicate yourself to it, you start learning about it. You start learning about creative financing. You start putting money aside for it. If you put in the work five years from now, you will find a way or a solution or a path to being able to start investing in real estate and at least making your first real estate deal. But you have to get committed to that. The third way that you can invest your money to protect against inflation is to invest into an active asset. And in this particular instance, when I talk about an active asset, I'm not talking about investing in stocks or real estate actively. I'm talking about investing into your own business. Because when you invest in your own business, what are you doing? You're investing into the infrastructure that allows you to create an income. You're investing into the ability to create and build a money printing machine. Now again, worst case scenario, what happens if dollars go to nothing. Well, now you can change what you charge for your products or for your business. And so now when you're investing in your own business, you are building an inflation hedge. Now, again, when you have a business in general, inflation is good for you because now when inflation happens, you can raise the price of your products to compensate for inflation. If the prices of things, if inflation goes up by 2%, if inflation is 2%, and you have to raise the price of your products 2%, well, your cost will also rise by 2%, which means if 
you sell something for $100. Your cost is $50. Your cost went up by 2%. That means it went from $50 to $51. And now you are selling your product for, instead of $100, $102. That means you increased your costs and your sales price by 2%. Well, now you pay more money. You're paying 51, but you're generating 102, which means you're effectively making a little bit more money as well. This is where now there's a lot of benefit to being a business owner. Now, again, not everybody's meant to be a business owner. Not everybody can be a business owner. Not everybody should be an entrepreneur. Let me actually rephrase that. Everybody should be a business owner if you are in America. If you are in America, in this capitalist system, you need to be a business owner, period. But that doesn't mean you need to operate a business or run a business. In fact, most people should not. You can be a business owner by investing in stocks. That makes you a business owner. But you should not be in the business of operating a business. Some people should. Being an entrepreneur is difficult. And if you want to be an entrepreneur, that can be another way for you to invest your money into your own business idea, into your own brand idea, to build an infrastructure. Now, this could be a intellectual infrastructure into the value of your business and what you do to sell products, or this could also be physical infrastructure, machinery, real estate, other places that will allow you to continue to run your operations. So when you invest in your own business, again, you're, you're building this asset that will allow you to protect yourself against inflation and whatever else is going on in the economy. And the fourth type of asset that I think a lot of people worry about when you hear about concerns with the United States dollar are what are the protectionary assets out there that will allow me to protect and preserve my wealth no matter what's going on out there. Now, the first one is one that I've already talked about, which is real estate. Real estate can be a great protectionary asset because, again, it's something that you can see, feel, and touch that provides a real tangible value. If you own land, you own this building, it can provide shelter to somebody, and it can produce an income for you. So that real estate can be a great protectionary asset because number one, it's tangible. Number two, it provides a very visible value. And number three, it can produce cash flow with that as well. The second one, which is growing in popularity, would be something like physical gold. Now, I own physical gold. It's not a huge piece of my portfolio. My physical gold is about 2% of my entire investment portfolio. And it doesn't really do much. My physical gold just sits there, just looks back at me. It doesn't generate an income like my real estate does. It doesn't do anything. It's just a hedge. I look at gold like insurance, doomsday insurance against the worst case scenario. For me, in fact, I don't even really pay attention to the prices of gold. I don't keep up with that. What I do is I look at gold as an alternative way for me to save money. Every month I have a passive system set up where every month I have some cash that leaves my check-in account, and it's automatically going out to buy me some physical gold, period. It's just an alternative way for me to save what I call hard money. And the reason why I personally invest in gold is because my theory is if I took $50,000 of cash today, and then I took $50,000 worth of physical gold, and I dug both of these in my backyard today, and I buried it, and then 10 years from now, I go to dig these up, I dig up the $50,000 with the cash. I dig up the $50,000 with the gold. I believe, my theory is 10 years from now, my gold will have more buying power than my cash. Could I be wrong? Absolutely, but this is my theory. And that's why I also have gold as an alternative way for me to save money. Now, some people also use silver. You can do your own research on silver. Some people like silver because silver is used in a lot of applications in the world. It's used in a lot of businesses. I just buy gold because one... Gold has been like that currency since the beginning of time. Everybody has valued physical gold. So for me, it's a simple way for me to get exposure to that. The third way for you to own and invest in protectionary assets is again now going to be through the stock market, this time through investing in countries and currencies that are not the United States dollar. Because in the United States stock market, in our stock market, you can get exposure to countries and currencies overseas. There are ETFs that will allow you to do this, that will allow you to invest in international countries, that will allow you to invest in emerging markets. I'll give you a couple examples. Again, not telling you what to invest in, do your own research, but a couple examples are VXUS, 
and VWO. And as a disclaimer, I personally invest in VWO. These are two different ETFs now that will give you exposure to countries and currencies outside of the United States, outside of the United States dollar. So now what are you doing? You're taking a risk. So these are higher risk ETFs, higher potential upside, higher potential downside. But now the whole idea is if something bad were to happen to the dollar, these are a little bit more protected because, well, these entities are a little bit shielded from the dollar. These are countries that, yeah, maybe they'll be impacted if the dollar gets hurt, they'll be impacted if the United States economy gets hurt, but they don't rely and revolve their currencies and their economies around the United States dollar. So now, when you create your investment portfolio, you can find different types of ETFs to invest in. Like what I do is I have four different general categories of ETFs that I invest my money in. Again, don't copy me. Do what's best for you. I don't recommend what I do to anybody. The first thing that I invest in and the largest thing that I invest in are dividend paying ETFs. Why? Because I like cash flow. Number two are value ETFs. Why? Because, well, it's a kind of your more stable and safe, considered safe investment. And it also pays cash flow. Number three are the innovation ETFs, more risk, more potential return. I like investing in innovation. For me, it's fun. And number four are my international ETFs for this very reason. These are my protectionary ETFs. These are countries and currencies overseas that give me exposure to things like emerging markets, to other international countries. That way now I can invest in the businesses and the countries that are not reliant on the United States dollar. So it's an alternative way for you to get exposure and protection against the dollar. And then this brings me to the last protectionary asset, which would be cryptocurrency. Now, again, I don't recommend this to anybody. Cryptocurrency is highly volatile, highly risky. I invest in cryptocurrency. The reason why I invest in cryptocurrency is because I believe in the value of the blockchain. I think there's a ton of power, a ton of use cases for cryptocurrency. But I think a lot of people who get involved with cryptocurrency think of it as a get-rich-quick scheme and they use it for things that cryptocurrency is not necessarily intended for. So I like cryptocurrency because I've used it before. I have people that work for me in countries out far away. And now if I want to send them money, previously what I'd have to do was I'd have to go to the bank and send them wires. This used to be a very painful process. And yes, the bank that I used to bank with didn't allow me to send wires to my phone. So it was a big pain. I had to go to the bank physically and send wires. Well, I also began traveling a lot. And now when I would get payment requests and I was traveling, and if my bank wasn't near me, it was a big stressor for me because I hate when people are relying on me to pay them. I When I get a bill, I want to pay it as fast as possible. I hate bills sitting over my head. It's just a, a pet peeve for me that I, it just really stresses me out. So now I was in California at the time. Actually, I'm in California right now too. But I was in California at the time and there was no bank nearby me. And it created a lot of stress for me because now I had to figure out I had to go pretty far to go out and find this bank, to go in there, make this wire, and then pay my contractor. Well, then after a bunch of times of this happening, he said, hey, would you mind just paying me in cryptocurrency? Because his country didn't allow PayPal. It didn't allow Payoneer. It didn't allow a lot of different platforms. And I said, yeah, I got crypto. He said, would you mind paying me in crypto? So I went on to my brokerage. I sent him some crypto in less than a minute. Not only did he receive the money, but the fees were a tiny fraction of what I was paying before. And that was when I realized, okay, there's some real value here with cryptocurrency because it can change the way that we do payments. They can change a lot of different things. So I like cryptocurrency for that reason. Am I advocating for you to buy crypto? Absolutely not. But you also have to understand how cryptocurrency pays a part in my portfolio. 10% or 20%, less than 20% of my portfolio, I'm getting the numbers mixed up now, less than 20% of my portfolio are what I call speculative investments. The other 80% are more of the proven investments. So 80% of my portfolio is real estate and stocks. The bulk of my real estate portfolio and my stock market portfolio are primarily for cash flow. In fact, all of my real estate investments are for cash flow, but the bulk of my stock market investments are for cash flow. That's 80%. 2% is physical gold. That leaves 18%. But in there, the 18%, these are what I call my speculative investments. This is where I invest in things like startups, and this is where I invest in things like cryptocurrency. So now, if cryptocurrency went down to zero and I lost all my cryptocurrency investments, would it affect me? No. 
but I also believe in the value of the blockchain. I think there's a lot of upside, which is why I invest in it. If you are going to invest in cryptocurrency, you have to be willing to accept that risk. You have to understand the volatility of cryptocurrency, and then you have to know why it is that you're investing in it. So understand that for what it's worth. And again, this also creates another potential protectionary investment, but I'm hesitant to say that just because of how new cryptocurrency is and how volatile it is as well. But it is a way to diversify your money away from some of the traditional investments. Most people don't want to believe this, but you don't need to make a lot of money to become a millionaire. If you can invest $4 a day or even just $100 a month, that's less than $4 a day, you can become a millionaire. Numbers have showed us this from history. If you can invest $100 a month, that's less than $4 a day, and you can get an average 10% return on your money a year, and you do this for 46 years, you will retire a millionaire, which means if you start at age 21 and you start investing $100 a month and you never invest another penny besides the $100 a month, you will retire a millionaire. Now, the first question you're going to ask is, but just breathe. Where am I going to get a consistent 10% return? Well, if we look at history, the S&P 500, which is the largest 500 companies in the stock market, have on average over the last century grown by around 10% a year. Even though we've seen recession after recession after recession, even though we've seen market crash after market crash after market crash, on average, even despite all these downturns in the economy and the market, the S&P 500 has still grown on average by 10% a year over the last 50 years, over the last 100 years. Now, you don't have to go and invest individually into each one of these companies. There are funds that will allow you to invest into something like the S&P 500. Again, the S&P 500 is a group of the 500 largest companies on the stock market. If you go to your stock brokerage, I'm not telling you what to invest, and I'm just giving you an example. Always do your own due diligence. Never trust a random guy on YouTube investing as risks. You understand all that. If you went to your stock brokerage and you bought shares of SPY or VOO, as a disclaimer, I own shares of VOO, both of these are ETFs that give you exposure to the S&P 500. So now, if you were buying the S&P 500 $100 a month from the day you turned 21 to the day you turned 66, you would have retired a millionaire on that $100 a month. Now, of course, yeah, this is looking back in time, but that's what would have happened if you made those small incremental investments, which is why it's so important to get started, even if you don't have a ton of money to start, because most people have the ability to put aside $4 a day. Now, your next question is going to be, but just breathe. By the time I'm 66 years old, a million dollars is going to be nothing. And sure, a million dollars today is going to be worth more than a million dollars in 30 years or a million dollars in 20 years. You're 100% correct. But you also have to remember, I'm talking about investing $4 a day and never adjusting how much money you invest. If you start with $4 a day today, $100 a month today, and then as your income grows, you also start investing more money. Let's say you start investing $100 a month today. Next year, you invest $105 a month. The year after that, $110 a month. The year after that, $120 a month. Guess what? You're not going to have a million dollars when you retire. You're going to have more than a million dollars. So yeah, the value of a million dollars is going to adjust with inflation as time goes on because inflation is still here. Inflation is going to be around today and 10 years from now and 20 years from now and 30 years from now. But you can also work to match that by also increasing how much money you invest. So now the question is, well, what's holding so many people back? And this is where we have well, a lot of things happening. Number one, it is no longer access to technology, right? I mean, we have so many tools now in our tool belt, tools in our tool belt, that allow people to start investing their money very simply. That's the great part. I love that part about fintech is that investing has become so accessible for the average person, for anybody, that anybody can start investing with as little as even $1 now with some apps. The downfall now, this, the double-edged sword to this is people have access to this financial technology to start investing, but the financial education is lacking. And this is where now people get caught up in the weight you're telling me that if I invest $100 a month for 46 years, I'll become wealthy. But if I put $100 into this meme stock or into this cryptocurrency or into this particular thing that's going to boom in six months, I could 10x my money way faster and I don't got to wait to become wealthy over the long term. Now we have this 
the exciting and the attractive and the fun side of investing, which really isn't investing. It's trading, it's gambling, it's speculating. Look, there is a place for trading. It's not for me. I don't trade. I don't know how to trade. I've tried trading before. I spent a lot of time trying to figure that out and I didn't make any money. In fact, I don't even know if I lost money, but I, I probably lost a little bit of money doing that, but I lost a whole lot of time. Over the long term, what we have seen again and 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 again are the investors, the long-term investors are the people that will make more money over the long term, period, over traders. When times are good, the economy is booming, money is flowing, interest rates are low, everything's going up, traders will make a lot of money. We've seen that happen. And then that's when people get attracted to, wow, this person made so much money on this trade. Wow, I can't believe how fast you made that much money. Wow. Do you think I should come in too? Do you think I can make the type of money too? And that's what gets a lot of people excited to start throwing their money into things that they don't understand, whether it's cryptocurrency, whether it's meme stocks, whether it's other stocks, whether it's penny stocks, whether it's anything. People will start throwing their money into things before they understand them because you think, what if I can also see those big returns? But the reality is those returns are fleeting. If you get in quick enough and you sell before a bus, yeah, you can make a lot of money but it's a game and this is an active game and it's a game that many people, most people will lose money in. And that's where now you have to understand the right way to do it yourself. Now you might be saying, but just please, don't you invest in cryptocurrency? Yeah, but I'm not trading. I understand a different way of investing, right? I buy cryptocurrency every day and it's a small piece of my portfolio. It's the speculative part of my portfolio. And so for me, I don't look at buying my investments like a trade. I'm looking at things 10 years down the road and what this will be worth to me then. And I don't advocate anybody to do what I do. I want you to take your own education and invest in what's important to you. So now, if you can become a millionaire with as little as $100 a month and you can make even more money if you invest more money, the next question is, well, what's stopping people? So it's not the technology. Now we talked about the financial education. The last thing is, well, do I really want to wait that long? And now we get into this whole investment overload, this education overload. And it's the same with so many industries, right? The, the, the good part about social media is now people, you have access to unlimited education for free. You can go and learn about how to lose weight. You can go and learn about nutrition. You can go and learn about money. But there are so many opinions. In the health and fitness space, there are so many opinions about what's the best diet. Is it vegan? Is it carnivore? Is it keto? Is it whatever, intermittent fasting? Whatever the other diets are. There's so many options. And so if you're just getting started and you start learning about all these options, you can very quickly be overloaded with it and say, you know what, I'm just going to stick with my donuts and cream cheese and I'm going to be good with that. We see it happen all the time with money where people start looking at all their options. Okay, I got ETFs. That looks cool. Oh, index funds. Oh, what about mutual funds? Oh, real estate. Oh, syndicate real estate deals, crowdfunded real estate deals, private equity deals, lending money. Oh, and, and now all of a sudden you get bombarded with all this information and then you have a lot of people saying, you have to invest in this one thing. This is how you build wealth. When most of the times when people are telling you you have to invest in stocks or you have to invest in real estate or you have to invest in options, most of them have their own agenda as to why they think there's nothing other else out there. In reality, you can invest in whatever it is that you want, assuming it's a good investment, right? You can invest in stocks and build wealth. You can invest in real estate and build wealth. But you have to find the right option for you. And the, the mistake that so many people make and the reason why so many people don't become wealthy from their investments isn't because they made the wrong investment. It isn't because they invested into something with the wrong expense ratio. It's because they never got started. There are three factors that will determine how wealthy you will become for your investments. It is number one, time. How long do you invest your money for? Number two, dollars. How much money are you investing? And number three, return. What is the return that you can get on your money? You can work to improve the return and you can work to improve the dollars. The one thing that you cannot change is time. We cannot go back in time and start investing 10 years ago, but we can get started today. That is the one factor that we cannot change. And that's why it is so important to just get started. 
You don't have to make a commitment, a life commitment today with your investing strategy. You can start investing in ETFs today and then six months later say, you know what, I'm going to invest in index funds or I'm going to invest in mutual funds or I'm going to invest in real estate. That's okay. You will change because you're going to learn. You don't get to know everything going into it, but you have to get started. Time is the only factor that you cannot change. You can change how many dollars you invest because what happens to a lot of people is you start investing and you get into this whole game of, oh, wow, I'm starting to understand this. I'm starting to see that light at the end of the tunnel. I'm starting to see what it would be like to compound my money. You play, start playing with those compound interest calculators online and you start to see what it would be like for your money to compound. And that's when you say, I need more money to invest because I want to put some fuel on this fire. And that's a great feeling when you get there. The first thing that a lot of people do when they get there is you stop eating out. You stop going on vacations. You stop spending money. And, you know, that's something I think most people need to do in the beginning that you know how to live below your means, know how to make those sacrifices. But then the next thing is how do you work to earn more money? And the reason why you're working to earn more money now isn't so you can drive a faster car or a bigger home like most people are doing. It's so you can invest more money. So, yeah, you can change how many dollars you invest which will impact how wealthy you become because the more money you invest, the wealthier you can become. But then the third factor you have to also work on is the return. How can you get the highest return? Now, the way you can get the best return is, number one, you start building that financial education. You learn how to make better investments. You learn how to you know, make better things, make better decisions with your money that we can get a better return, but also pay less money in fees. That way, more of that return goes in your pocket. So you can work on the return side. You can work on how much money you invest, but you cannot change how much time you have, which is why you have to get started sooner rather than later because the longer your money has to compound and grow, the bigger your wealth will be. And the most difficult part about this is that concept of delayed gratification because, again, in today's society, when we want something, we want it today. When we want a luxury handbag, we want it today. You buy it with 0% APR. You buy it with a no-interest credit card. You buy it with buy now, pay later. It is so accessible to have whatever we want right now, and that is what got a lot of people into the tough financial places that they are today because – we want convenience. Amazon was built on the whole concept of convenience, where now I don't have to go to the store to buy something. I can buy it online. Now, don't get me wrong. I love shopping on Amazon. I barely go into the store. I, I don't like going into stores to shop because it's a waste of my time. I love this idea of convenience. But the whole model was built on convenience. And now it's one-click purchase. You want to buy a new laptop? You can buy it with one click. You want to buy a new microphone? Buy it with one click. Getting whatever you wanted has become so convenient. And then came, okay, you want to buy a laptop you can't afford? No worries. You don't have to afford the laptop. You can buy it, pay it later. You can pay it in installments. And this is where now the convenience is starting to impact people's finances. Because now we're saying, all right, you can go and spend whatever it is that you want. Just worry about the price later. And there's a reason why buy now, pay later, 0% APR are so profitable, right? Buy now, pay later, as I like to call it, broke now, broke later is one of the fastest growing fintech industries out there. Why? Because there's such a big demand for it. Why is there such a big demand? Well, number one, inflation is still extremely high and the cost of living has gone up so quickly. And then number two, people love having things now. We want to have things today. And that has caused the boom of things like buy now, pay later. But now let's think about this for a second because the whole idea is, or the marketing pitch is, 0% APR. You don't got to pay any interest for this. And so what a lot of people think is, I found a special loophole that I can have more stuff today. It doesn't have to cost me anything because there's no interest. And I get to have all the nice things. So I found this little loophole in finance. But let's think about this for a second. There's a cost to money. There's a cost to borrowing money. Because, I mean, if borrowing money was free, banks would not charge you interest to get a mortgage. So if businesses or these buy now, pay later apps are giving you money for free with buy now, pay later or 0% APR, how are they making money? Well, they are making money. In fact, it is extremely profitable. So how? Well, the first thing is they know that if they can sell you a computer on buy now, pay later, you might also buy a mic with buy now, pay later because you don't have the pain of paying, I don't know, $3,000 for these laptops now. So now you might buy a mic to go with it. Maybe you'll also buy a camera. 
to go with it. Maybe you'll also buy a handbag to go with it because now you can buy all these things on buy now, pay later. And instead of paying that $3,000 up front, you can just pay $100 a month for each thing. You don't have the same pain of that money leaving you, so you're gonna end up buying more stuff. So the first thing is, buy now, pay later encourages people, and statistics show this, the majority of people will buy more stuff. Number two, it's, okay, so now I start buying all these things, and then I have all these monthly payments. If I don't pay it off in the nine months or 18 months that's given to me, I'm now gonna be slapped, not with a 5% interest rate, but with a 28 or a 35, maybe even a 39% interest rate. And so now all of a sudden, buy now, pay later went from this, oh, it's a special loophole that allows me to have more stuff without paying more money, to I am paying so much extra to buy all the things that I didn't know that I didn't need that I couldn't even afford in the first place. That's why these programs are so profitable. And this is where now you have to make that decision. What do you want first? Do you want the nice things or do you want the wealth? And if you're watching this video, I know what it is that you want. You want that wealth first. So you have to switch the way that you think because the reality is the majority of people will never understand this, right? We're, we're raised in this consumerism culture and it's very unfortunate. And if you want to break out of that, the first thing you got to do is you got to change your mindset as to what it is that you want and when you want it. Now, when you can change your mindset on the way you spend, you can change your mindset on the way that you invest because it goes hand in hand. It is your brain strings work the same way when it comes to long-term thinking. If you want to have all the nice stuff now, what makes you think that you're going to be able to invest for the long term and build your wealth that way? If you want all the nice stuff now, you're going to want to invest your money and grow it the same way. And what ends up happening is when you want the quick returns in your money, well, you're probably going to, be the one that loses your money and pays for somebody else's long-term gains. And so now you lose both ways. And then you start hating the investing game. You start hating the system. You hate Wall Street. You hate corporations. You hate banks. And you just get into this whole system of just working to pay your bills and never wondering why you can never get ahead. But it starts with your mindset now. If you want to break out of the system and really build true wealth for your stuff, for yourself and your family, and your community, and build true generational wealth, it starts with your mindset where now, okay, when I spend my money, I'm gonna spend what I can afford, meaning money that's coming out of my pocket with cash, not going into debt to buy these things. Now you understand, okay, yeah, maybe I can't buy the nice laptop today. Maybe I can't buy the nice stuff today. I gotta downsize because I want to be able to afford it with cash, especially when it's liabilities, something that's not making me any money. You gotta make sure you're not buying things that you cannot afford. The simplest thing you can do is follow something like my rule of five, which says if you can't buy five of them, you can't afford one of them. Then you reframe your spending. Now you're going to start reframing the way you invest. Now you're going to understand, okay, we're working the long game here. We're working to build that wealth now. Okay, I can build wealth. I can become a millionaire with $100 a month if I have enough time. I need to just get started. And this is where now you start investing. And again, there are so many ways to invest, but you got to just get started. Start doing your research, start reading books, but also get started by putting your money aside to start investing. Then as you do that, that's when you start learning. And as you start to learn, maybe you'll change your investing strategies. Maybe you'll say, you know, what? I want to invest in stocks instead. Maybe you want to invest in individual companies instead. You will start to learn, but you have to start building that discipline because now investing is a long-term game. The people that build the most wealth are not the people that hit something quick. They hit the lottery in the stock market. It's people that are working to build long-term wealth. There's a saying this about Warren Buffett who says, when the tide goes out, you see who's been swimming naked. And what that means is that when the free money, when the economic boom goes away, you see who's been living this fantasy lifestyle where they've been living high off of the economic boom but then when you see that money and that whole system start to slow down, those people are the first ones to lose everything. And it can be very easy to fall into that trap because it's a very emotional thing. Oh my God, yeah, why would I want to wait to get rich when I can get rich now? I mean, get, get rich slowly is not a very attractive term. If you had the option to get rich quick or get rich slowly, 100 out of 100 people would pick get rich quick. But the reality is most people don't. 
the vast, vast, vast majority of people will never get rich quick. It's get rich slowly. Yet we get attracted to the get rich quick because our emotions go this way if our mindset is not wired to understand that this get rich quick is probably going to fail. We look at the opportunity, but we never look at the risk on the get rich quick. But what's interesting is when we look at the get rich slowly, now, instead of looking at the opportunity, we're looking at the risk. The risk is, man, that's a long time from now. What if it doesn't work out? What if a million dollars in 40 years isn't worth as much as it is today? So instead, we take all the riskier options with a much lower potential to actually succeed. So yes, you can become wealthy, even if you don't make a ton of money, even if you don't know a lot about money, even if you don't know how to invest as long as you get started and you can invest your money for long enough. And then as you do that, you keep learning. And as you learn, you apply what you learn. And as you make more, you also work to invest more. The more you invest, the wealthier you can you become. Remember, there's three things that will determine how wealthy you become. Time, dollars, and return. As you make more, you can invest more dollars. The sooner you start, the more time you have. The return, how, much, how fast your money grows, is going to depend on how you learn, how you can minimize fees, and how you can grow the investments that you're making, right? This is all about the speed of money. How fast can you grow your money? And the way that you can grow your money faster is by learning more about money, learning more about investing, building that financial intelligence, building that financial education. That way you can go out and get better returns on your money. The thing that so many people get wrong about passive income or cash flow is they think that is the secret to getting rich. When in reality, Cash flow or passive income is the byproduct of being rich in the first place. You have to have money and then you can use this money to buy these assets to pay you with cash flow. The reason why so many people get scammed or screwed over on this whole idea of passive income is because they think that, oh, if I do X, Y, and Z, if I start day trading, if I start doing online surveys, if I start making YouTube videos, it is going to create passive income for me. When in reality, well, guess what? It's going to take a lot of work. And a lot of these things are going to cost you a lot of time. And a lot of these things might even lose you money unless you're willing to dedicate yourself to it. The way that you can generate true cash flow, true passive income, is you got to generate the income first. You got to generate the cash. And then you take this dead cash that's sitting in your bank that's not doing anything. And then you're going to put it to work by buying an asset. You're buying real estate. You're buying dividend paying stocks. You're buying a business. You're buying something that's now active, that's working to produce you cash flow. That's the way that passive income works. And most people don't want to say that because, well, everybody's lured to the idea of passive income because, well, who doesn't want to get paid while they're sleeping? Everybody loves that idea. But if you really want to generate that type of passive income that doesn't require your full-time effort, well, you're going to have to put in the work. And it's really funny when you hear people talking about how you can build this online business and it's going to be passive. Listen, I have an online business. It generates income. It generates income when I'm sleeping, but it's not passive. It's my full-time job. Briefs Media is my full-time job. Sure, sometimes we get sales overnight. Sure, sometimes we have sales deals come in overnight when I'm sleeping. But guess what? I run the company every single day. It's a full-time job. And so running a business is not passive income. People love the idea of passive income, which is why you see it thrown around everywhere on the internet. But the true Passive, quote unquote, passive income is owning assets, dividend paying stocks, owning real estate, getting interest from a high interest savings account in your savings account, or owning a passive business. That's what most people would really consider, quote unquote, passive income, but it takes number one, work to get there. And number two, you still got to manage your portfolio. I own a portfolio of real estate, and guess what? I'm still managing. I'm looking at my monthly reports, I'm looking at my quarterly reports, I'm meeting with my property managers regularly to make sure that the deals are still making me money, to make sure that these deals are still good. So yeah, there's still some level of work in it, but this is where the next thing you have to ask is, is passive income really what you want right now? And I remember having a conversation with a guy in the gym about this, where there was this young, I think he was like 24 years old, 22 years old, really young guy who told me that he wants to generate passive income. And I said, why? And he was like, I want to be rich. And I said, okay, why? Like, what are you really trying to get at? And he was talking about how he loved this idea of not having to work for money. And I said, okay, well, let's, let's talk about this. If you can generate, say, a 10% cash-on-cash yield on your money, a 10% return on your money, which is 
a really good return, especially in this economy. It's a really good cash flow on your money, meaning for every $100 you invest, you get $10 of cash flow or passive income, whether it's from stocks or real estate or whatever it might be. If you can generate a 10% return on your money, how much money would you need to be rich? And he probably said, I think like a couple hundred thousand dollars or something. And I said, okay, well, that means you would need $2 million invested into assets today. That way you can generate your $200,000 worth of cash flow. Is that really what you want to do right now? Do you have $2 million? And this is where now the question is, what are you really working for? I get it. People want financial freedom. Financial freedom comes from owning assets that pay you. But what is it do you really want? Because if you're an entrepreneur, if you have that hustler or I want to build a business mindset, your goal isn't passive income. Your goal is building a business. And then if you can build a business, you can build your income, then you can take the income or the sale of your business. You can take this money that you've earned, that you've built, that you've created, and then you can use this money to go out and buy the passive income. That's what's going to buy you the freedom. So that's where now you have to ask the question of what is it that you're truly working for? Do you want the passive income where you're just looking to create a new stream of income? That way you have this cash flow so you have that financial freedom? Or are you looking to build that real richness right now where you're looking to build your income, you're looking to build your business, you're looking to build the valuation of what you have, that way you can sell it or that way you own this big cash flow producing business, which isn't passive, until you either sell it or until you hire a new CEO, but you're working to build this product. And then one day when you're ready, you can take this value, this business, and then you can go out and buy these 10% cash flow producing assets. And again, many times assets are not going to pay 10%, but just for a hypothetical. And so that's where now you have to start asking yourself and understand what's going on. There's nothing wrong with investing for cash flow. I love investing for cash flow, but my number one investment is into my own business. And the reason why is because when I invest my money into my own business, there's no limit to the types of returns that I can see, right? When I go out and invest in real estate, which is my favorite way to generate cash flow, I also generate cash flow from dividend paying stocks. But if I'm investing my money into real estate to generate cash flow, my goal is to get a 7% cash on cash return, a 7% cash flow on my money. When I invest my money in the stock market, I'm getting dividends. Maybe it's 3 or 4%. When I put my money into a high interest savings account, maybe it's 4 to 5%. So we're talking 3 to 7% are the types of cash flow returns that I'm getting when I put my money into these passive assets. When I put my money into my own business, my goal isn't to get a 3 to 7% return on my money. My goal is to get a 10, 20, 30, 200% return on my money because now when I put money into my business to hire more people, to invest in more softwares, to invest in more marketing. Now my goal is to accelerate the growth of the business. We're trying to take more market share. We're trying to increase the amount of products that we can sell. We're trying to increase the size of our business. It's a completely different game. It's not passive. I work every single day in the business. It's not passive at all, but it creates the opportunity for more income, which can then buy me more passive income. And I don't like using the terms passive income because there's always some sort of work required. I like the terms cash flow, but I'm just sticking with passive income because everybody in the internet is looking for this types of passive income. And this is what I'm trying to get you to understand is what do you really want? If you just want the financial freedom and you want that type of passive income, great, because you don't like your job, fine. Every time you get paid, put some money into these types of assets, the passive assets, whether it's rental properties, whether it's crowdfunded real estate deals, whether it's dividend paying stocks, whatever it might be, that way now you can start generating this cash flow and you can do this. And every time you get paid with your cash flow, you buy more of these assets. You get paid with the dividends, you buy more dividend paying ETFs and you just keep playing this game where you just keep working to buy more of these assets. Maybe you do it for a decade, maybe you do it for two decades and you stick with it, you stay aggressive with it, you're working to spend less so you have more money to invest, you're working to earn more so you have more money to invest. Pretty soon, you're going to have a strong cash flow producing portfolio where you have enough income to fund your lifestyle and now you can not have to worry about your job as much because now you have that cash and freedom. But if you are more of the entrepreneurial type and you want to build that income, it's a completely different game. Now you're not playing for this passive income yet per se. You're working to build the income and then you can use the income to then fund the passive income as you grow that income and you got to find that right balance for you. I don't invest in real estate the way that I used to because I have a better investment opportunity in my business. Now, if I see a good rental property, sure, maybe I'll invest in it, but my number one priority right now is investing into my own business 
because that's where I see the most opportunity for me. Now, of course, this is where, again, it pays to stay up to date on what's happening because it will allow you to make the smartest decisions with your money. The best way for you to stay up to date on what's happening is to actually read the raw data, read the press releases. That way you don't get bogged down with all the emotions. If you don't have the time or the interest to do that, the second best thing to do is to join something like Market Briefs, which is my free financial newsletter, which I created to help regular investors, number one, stay up to date on what's happening. Number two, avoid all the sensationalism. And number three, save time because you read our newsletters in less than five minutes every morning. So if you haven't joined Market Briefs yet, it's completely free and it's an easy way for you to stay up to date on what's happening in the financial markets. And I'll put the link to how you can join down in the description below. And you can also go to briefs.co slash market. That's briefs.co slash market. If you are in your 30s and you want to figure out how you can start investing, it is not too late, but you need to get started ASAP because there are three factors that will determine how wealthy you will become. Number one is how much money you invest. Number two is the return that you get on your money. And number three is the time, meaning how long that you can invest your money for. So for example, if you want to be a successful investor, there are 10 mindset traits that every successful investor has that I'm going to go over in this video. And number one, if you want to be a successful investor, being avoiding the shiny object syndrome. Now, when I say shiny object syndrome, I don't mean now you take your money and you go out and buy fancy cars and nice things because that's the attractive thing to do. I'm talking about the attractive investments because now when you have $5,000, $10,000 put aside, you can go out and invest at the slow and steady place, which is more likely to give you a long-term return. And you know that, but you see that nice meme stock or you hear of that new cryptocurrency that's about to blow up or hear this new investment opportunity that nobody knows about that is on the verge, the cutting edge of being able to 10x your money almost overnight, about a year. So it's not a get-rich-quick scheme. It's like a 12-month game plan. But you can take your $5,000 and turn it into fifty grand by this time next year. I mean, that's You have to work a whole 12 months to earn that much money. You can just put this money in, double how much money you're making by putting this money into this, not a get-rich-quick investment, but a get-rich-almost-quick investment. But what ends up happening to most people who start chasing these types of shiny investments are, well, you end up paying the price. And they go through these bubbles where the early people who get into these types of amazing opportunities, you might be able to get in, be a testimonial, and get out quickly. But it's almost like a drug where when you start to make that money, you don't want to get out. And so now you want to go in even deeper. You make some money and then you put it all back in there, maybe even more. And you start telling your friends about how much money you're making. And then that's when they come in and it keeps growing until ultimately this investment, which was poised to make everybody so rich, starts to implode because it didn't have any real value to begin with. There is a lot of value in being a long-term investor. It's not the most attractive thing to do, but... There's a reason why over the long term, the successful investors are not the ones that see this overnight success. It's the ones that have worked to build a long-term sustainable portfolio. They say the faster it comes, the faster it goes because, well, if you don't have to go through the work and pain to earn it, you're not going to know how to keep it either. The second thing every successful investor does is they invest in their mind. And this is where I want you to understand the difference between the price you paid, the cost, and the value that you receive. And there's a lot of different examples of this, of price versus cost. But this is where now you have to understand what is valuable to you. And I remember this example because when I was getting started in real estate, I got my real estate salesperson's license and began working for a company called Keller Williams. And then the broker that I was working with told me that she was hosting this seminar on real estate investing. And because I was in her office, she was going to give me a free ticket. I said, okay, cool. I go there and somebody was pitching a class. It was $3,500, I believe, on how to wholesale real estate. I had no idea what wholesaling real estate was. It seemed like a super attractive thing, especially for me getting started in real estate and trying to understand the whole game. And so that was a lot of money for me then. I mean, it's still a lot of money today, but it was a lot of money for me then. But I went out and I spent that $3,500. Now, this is where I know a lot of people, because I talked to a lot of people about this back then, got hung up on the $3,500. Why would I want to spend $3,000 
$500 on this class. Education should be free. That's way too much money. It's just making them rich, right? We're focused on the price. We're focused on the cost as opposed to what's the value that I'm going to get. Well, I spent that money on the class and I knew that I wanted to do something with it and I went through it. And well, after month one, I didn't make my money back. I made no money. After month two, I didn't make any money back. I actually still hadn't made any money. Month three, that was when I also didn't make any money. But then in month four, I also made $0 from that class. It wasn't until month five that I actually made any money from this program. And in month five, I made, I think it was about $10,000 off of my first sale, which more than paid for the $3,500 that I had to spend. Now, it took a lot of work and effort on my part, but I had to spend money in order to get it. The value to me was way more than the cost that I had to pay. And then I also closed a lot of deals after that. But it took me an investment on my part. Now, I'm not saying go out and just throw your money around and just buy any class, every program, every coaching thing out there, no matter how much the price is. But you have to now look at the value that you receive. If you buy based off of value as opposed to price, it's a completely different way of analyzing things. I see this in almost anything. When I go to somewhere far, if I got to go to Europe, if I got to go to India, I, growing up, I used to say, I used to go to India pretty often. And I used to have to sit in the back economy, sit like a sardine and flying to India from the United States is like a 20 hour journey. When you sit in an economy, it is very uncomfortable. You can't sleep in those 20 hours because there's somebody to your left, somebody to your right. Somebody's always rolling over. The lights are always turning on. Somebody's always annoying you. There's just a bunch of things happening and you got to sit like this. It's not comfortable. It sucks. But then if you want to go to business class, you're going to pay three to six, maybe seven times more money to have a room, essentially, this area where you can have a reclining seat, you can lay down, the food is nicer, the service is nicer, it's way more peaceful, it's way more comfortable, and you can sleep comfortably. Now, again, both economy and business class are going to take you to where you got to go. One's just a whole lot more comfortable. And that value of that comfort is valuable to me, which is why I am willing and I do pay for that added price. Now, I don't always buy first class tickets. If I'm going on a short domestic flight, yeah, you bet. I'm going to sit in the back if it's cheaper. But if that value is worthwhile to me, I will pay for it depending on what it is. And this is where you have to figure out what value is important to you. I have spent a lot of money on education a ton of money on financial education and business education and business consultants. Some of it paid off. Some of it didn't. That's kind of the way life works. And this is where now you got to figure out what is valuable to you. And if something is valuable to you, be willing to spend money on that. For me, if I'm flying long distances, business class tickets are valuable to me. For me, business education is valuable to me. So I pay money for that. Sometimes it works. Sometimes I didn't. I had spent over $100,000 on consultants for a blog that I was working to build. And that's just the consulting fee. I also spent probably, I don't know how much, but at least another six figures on writers and editors and softwares and all this other stuff to build this blog. And guess what? It was a complete flop. I lost everything in that investment. So sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And this is where now understanding, okay, what is valuable to you? Be willing to spend money on things that are valuable to you, but also make sure that you have the ability to spend on it, right? But just, just because financial education is valuable to you doesn't mean that you should go into credit card debt to buy expensive programs if you're never going to do anything with it. So you got to be honest with yourself, but look at what's valuable, find the value. And if the value exceeds the price that you have to pay, this might be something you want to consider buying. Number three is you got to be a long-term investor. And this is one of those things that is so difficult for people, especially who are getting started with investing to wrap their heads around is because they think I'm going to put my money into this thing today and I'm going to monitor the heck out of my stock market portfolio every single day that will hopefully I'm going to be able to make a lot of money. But if you really want to build wealth, it's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen in six months. It's not even going to happen in six years. It is a long-term game. And this is where you got to just stay consistent. And this is one of those things where 
Building wealth is a marathon, it's not a sprint. And you can amplify how fast you can become wealthy. But the way you amplify it is by putting more fuel in the fire, meaning earning more money and putting more money into your investments. If you can work to earn more money, well, now you can go and buy more investments and build that wealth much sooner, build the cash flow much sooner, build the investment portfolio much sooner. But you have to be understanding that it takes time to build these investments. It is not something that happens in six months or even six years. This is a long-term game if you really want to get the rewards of being an investor. Number four is you ignore the traditional media. Look, I'm going to be a little bit honest here because I work in the media space, and most traditional media is in the business of selling hype and emotion. It's like TMZ. Why is TMZ so popular? All they do is try to get people angry or get people's emotions and doing a bunch of crazy things. People love watching people's emotions. You're attracted to that. Now, when you go into other news, like the financial news, it's a more sophisticated version of that. People love the drama. That's what draws the clicks. And I'm going to tell you very honestly here, YouTube works the same way. YouTube works on emotion. That's why you see a lot of titles and thumbnails that have to be a little bit clickbaity because if they're not... I'm going to be honest with you, it's going to end up in the YouTube graveyard. It sucks, but that's the way that it works. Now, that's one of the reasons I also have been working so hard to build Market Briefs, which is my daily financial newsletter, because it allows me and my team to distribute the financial news without the sensationalism, without the clickbaitiness, because all the news is in one email. And so now we don't have to go out and put out this clickbaity stuff, because once you open the email... Everything is there and we can provide all the unbiased information without all the emotion. But the reason why I'm saying this is now if you are working to understand what's going on in the financial markets, it's very easy to be drawn in with the emotions. And if you make decisions based off of headlines, it's going to be a very emotional roller coaster and a financial roller coaster for you. That means when you are investing your money, you got to cut out the emotion and look for the real opportunity. because. Most of the time, things are never as good as the media makes it seem, and things are never as bad as the media makes it seem. It's somewhere in the middle, and it's your job to figure out where that is. Now, if you want to actually figure that out, this is where you want to be digging into the raw data, reading unbiased news sources, and creating your own education yourself. That's my goal with Market Briefs. It's a free financial news editor that you can read. It's a simple email that you can read in less than five minutes every morning. And if you want to join Market Briefs, I got the link to how you can join down in the description below. Number five is you got to value your time. This one was very difficult for me because growing up, I was kind of cheap and I never really wanted to spend money on anything. And until I started valuing my time, it was very difficult for me to spend my money on certain things. And I'll give you an example. When I started investing in real estate, I knew I didn't want to be involved in managing my properties because the books that I read talked about in order to scale real estate, you need a team of people. That way you are not a property manager, you are a property investor. And that was the first time I really made that decision to value my time because I knew my goal was to own a real estate portfolio. And I already knew that there was no way that I could drive out to each house and talk to every tenant and do everything. It just seemed like way too much work because I was also in school when I started investing in real estate. So I went out and I hired a property manager. Now, when you're just starting off in real estate, you don't have a lot of negotiating power with a property manager. So you're going to pay close to 10% of a gross rental income to your property manager. If you rent out a property for $600, that's $60 a month. If you're renting it out for $1,000, that's $100 a month. If you're renting it out for $2,000 a month, that's $200 a month in management fees, which it's a pretty big chunk of your revenue right off of the top. But I knew that my time, that was the first time I valued my time. And I knew that my time was worth more than that. Because if I got sucked into the game of just managing tenants, there was no way that I was going to be able to earn money anywhere else. And this is a big thing that I see with other, especially newer real estate investors. But it's not just new ones. You see experienced real estate investors with 30 units doing the exact same thing. Where it's the same argument. I don't want to have to pay another person to do what I can do myself. And sure, you can manage your properties yourself. You can do a lot of things yourself. But there's only 24 hours in a day. And what do you want to spend your time doing? You're paying somebody to free your time up. You could do the same thing with having somebody go out and 
get your groceries, having somebody cook your meals for you, having somebody wash your clothes for you, clean your house for you, mow your lawn for you. There's a lot of different ways that you can buy your time back. And if the price you have to pay is lower than what your time is worth, then it's going to be beneficial for you now to pay somebody to do something instead of you. Now, there is a balance to this because if, especially if you're an entrepreneur, you're trying to build your own business in the beginning, you're probably going to be doing everything yourself for one, because you need to know how the business works. And number two, you got to keep that cash in your business because keeping the cash in your business right now is the most valuable thing. But as you grow, you got to start valuing your time and know when it's right to pay somebody else to do something for you. Number six is don't chase an investment. And this is probably one of the hardest lessons to learn unless you make the mistake yourself. And don't chase an investment means when you see a stock or any asset on the news growing quickly, you get excited and you say, oh, I want to get in too. You might hear of the newest tech companies, the newest AI companies, the newest whatever companies that have been booming. And now you don't want to miss out on the fun. And the common story amongst every time this happens is this stock or whatever asset has gone up by 50%. It's gone up by a lot. And every expert that comes onto the financial news says that there's so much more room for this thing to run. There's so much more upside. This is just the beginning. It's going to get so much better. And then now you get excited and you think, maybe I don't, I don't want to come in too late, but then you see the stock go up by another 10% and you say, you know what? Yeah, this is it. I, I want to get in. This is going to go up so much higher. I'm going to get in. Now you come in and you start buying. And in the short term, you might see your investment go up even more. But then what ends up happening a lot of times is two months go by and some bad news comes out. This company says we've been growing a little bit too big or we need to do layoffs or demand has started to slow down or cool off a little bit or technologies are changing or the company gets sued. All these things happen all the time. And then you see all of a sudden the stock drop by 35% almost overnight. Now the people that got in early before all the media hype, they're still up huge. But the people that were chasing who missed the early opportunity are now down. And this is where now when you buy with emotions, you're also much more likely to sell. Maybe if you held on, you might see big gains in the next five years, maybe 10 years, maybe not. But this is where now understanding why are you buying? If you're just trying to chase a rally, you're probably too late. Now, if you're buying it for the long term, that's a different story. But when you're trying to chase many times you're going to end up losing. Number seven, one person's pain is another person's opportunity. And I'm going to be very blunt with this because this is the reality of how our economic system works. When one person has to sell an investment at a huge loss, that means you can come in and buy it at a huge profit opportunity. When the 2008 crash happened, people were getting foreclosed on left and right. Now, it wasn't the investors who told people to go out and buy homes they couldn't afford to go out and take adjustable rate mortgages, to go out and do subprime mortgages, to tell the bankers to go out and do these sketchy loans, to issue loans, to do all these things. But it happened. And then people were getting foreclosed on. And when people got foreclosed on, the banks got overflooded with foreclosure properties. And then the banks had to start liquidating these foreclosure properties. And then investors were able to come in and buy these investments, these rental properties, these, these homes for pennies on the dollar. Why? Ultimately, because people made bad decisions. Banks made bad decisions. Bad things happened, which created good opportunities for investors. It happens all the time in multiple asset classes. When you see the stock market fall, well, many times when you see a big crash, that means that people had to oversell off because they had overbought. When people think that nothing can go wrong, they will buy with money that they can't afford to lose, maybe even use debt to buy investments. And then when things go down and they get underwatered, now you can see overselling. And when you see overselling, that creates an even bigger buying opportunity. This is unfortunately or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, the way that investing works. Somebody has to sell something that somebody is going to buy. And your job as an investor is to be able to buy good investments at a good price. And a good price means, well, if you can buy it at a discount, even better for you. 
You want to look for the opportunities. And that means number one, you have to be prepared. Number two, you have to be financially educated. And then number three, you have to be willing to take the opportunity when it comes your way, because the reality is somebody else's dumb mistake can be your great opportunity. Number eight is if it's too good to be true, it probably is. And there's no good way for me to explain this. But you know that feeling that you get in your gut? Everybody talks about this. It's hard to really quantify and qualify what that feeling is. But when it feels like something's off on a deal, it probably is. And trust your gut's instinct on this. If the person seems like everything is too perfect, if the asset seems like everything is just too rosy, everything is too nice, it probably is. And this is where understanding that when... People are desperate to sell something. They'll be much more likely to cover up the blemishes. So understand that. If something seems too perfect, too good, use your gut instinct and either do more research or potentially consider walking away because sometimes those can be either the get-rich-quick schemes that talk about how nothing bad can go wrong or it could be an investment that's on the verge of imploding. And this is where you've got to be able to differentiate the investment that's selling for a huge discount and the investment that someone's just trying to get rid of before the thing implodes. Number nine is understanding your worst investments because for most successful investors, their worst investment wasn't something that went down, wasn't something that they lost money on. It was a missed opportunity. It was a great investment opportunity that they didn't take. Now, you don't always know what a good investment opportunity is. Hindsight is twenty twenty. But that for pretty much everybody, is going to be their worst investment, is making the lost investment. This is where now looking through your investment opportunities and understanding that sometimes the ones that you can pretty much think are a guaranteed win are the ones that will lose. And the ones that you will never in a million years think will succeed are the ones that win. And the really successful investors are the ones that are able to kind of cut through all the noise Go through all the fancy stuff and find the real investment opportunity and stick with it for the long term. Now, again, hindsight is twenty twenty. You're never going to know until it happens. But understanding that sometimes the best investments are covered up with the most crap. And finally, number 10 is there will be another once in a lifetime opportunity. And this goes back to not being emotional because when you go through now your investment journey and you start finding investment opportunities, you're going to see some opportunities that you feel like are amazing. The stock, I cannot believe how low it's trading. This is going to be a great opportunity. Should I go into debt to buy it? Or maybe it's a real estate deal. This is an amazing property in an area where everything is developing and you cannot believe that this property is for sale. And you feel like this right here is a once in a lifetime opportunity. But if you're not ready to buy it, don't invest on emotion. Because there will be another once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. There is never just one once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, which is why you don't want to get emotional with your investments. If something is not adding up, if the numbers are not making sense, if something is not clear in the deal, don't go in and buy it just because you think that there will never be another opportunity like this again. There will be. There will be another once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. So don't go out and do something that is against your investment goals and your investment strategy just because you think that this is the only time that you're ever going to see a deal like this. Whew, that was a lot. What are some other mindset traits that every successful investor has? Let me know down in the comments below. I think a big reason why people are really searching for new ways to generate quote-unquote passive income is because the cost of living has grown so significantly relative to wages. Take a look at these numbers. Between 1970 and now, wages have increased by around 640%. Over that same time, housing costs have gone up by around 1100%. Car prices have gone up around 1500%. And public university prices have gone up by around 1900%. 100%. When you see these numbers, naturally, you can understand why people need more money to survive. You hear stories of your parents and your grandparents talking about, how, oh, back in my time, I used to work a job. My wife didn't have to work and I had enough money to fund my lifestyle. Well, today, that system doesn't work. Now you have two income households and people are still struggling to survive because households' incomes have risen but they haven't risen fast enough to keep up with the cost of living. And notice that when I showed you these numbers on the screen, I said household incomes, not your average wages. Household incomes are looking at both parties who are potentially earning an income. And back in the 1970s, 
it was one income generating the household income. Today, it's two incomes generating the household income, and people are still struggling to survive. And this is where it has become so crucial to understand how you can earn more money because the reality is if you want to continue living a decent lifestyle today, it has become so important to learn how to earn more money. And this is where you know the argument everyone's making is, oh, my boss needs to pay me more. Well, if they're not, you can ask for more money, but if they don't give it, you also need to find an alternative. Complaining, crying, kicking, screaming is not going to fix it, and this is where you have to understand the reality of what's going on in the economy. Now, I've talked about what has caused this. The cause of this is the inflation, because in the early 1970s, we had our dollar stripped from the gold standard, meaning the dollar was no longer tied to gold. The government could spend whatever amounts of money it wanted. The Federal Reserve Bank, which is a central bank here in the United States, could print an unlimited amount of money, which meant that the value of our dollar started to drop, causing the price of things to go up. When we started to see that happen, well, naturally the prices of things rose, and that's what then caused the inflation that we've been seeing over the last number of decades, and especially the last few years. All the money printing has devalued our currency, causing the price of things to go up, making it more difficult for people to survive off of one income and now even two incomes, which means if we fast forward now 10, 20, 30 years, what is it going to be? Is it going to be enough for people to survive off of one income like it was in the 1970s? Is it going to be the same like it is today where people need two incomes to survive? Or will it be four income households? As in two people need two jobs each in order to survive. Now you can guess and pick whichever it might be, but this is what I'm trying to get you to understand is, well, instead of trying to hope that things are going to go back to how it was in the 1970s, understand the trend. Inflation has made the cost of living rise faster than wages. Period. The cause of this is all the money printing because of the Federal Reserve Bank and the spending by the government. Unless the government stops spending so much money, which doesn't look like it's going to happen, and unless the Federal Reserve Bank says we're not going to keep printing any more money, which doesn't look like it's going to happen, we're going to continue seeing what we've been seeing over the last 50 years. So now as you project out for the later parts of your career, what's going to happen? Well, if the cost of living keeps rising, you are going to need more income which means you want to start preparing for this today. And I know this is not something that most people want to hear, but I'd rather you learn this sooner rather than later. That way you can prepare and take better care of your family. Right? My goal here isn't to make friends. My goal here is to help you be better with your money. That way you can make more wealth for yourself, your family, and your community. And this is where understanding this inflation problem is not going away. Even if inflation goes back down to 2%, it's still there. And that means the cost of living is going to keep rising and, well, if your wages are not keeping up, you're going to see the value of your earnings, the buying power of earnings continue to drop, and the buying power of your savings continue to drop while the prices of things keep rising. So now, how do you earn more money? Well, there's a lot of ways you can do this. And thankfully, today, there are more opportunities than ever before. And this requires, number one, your interest, and number two, your work ethic, because it is going to require more time on your part. Now, if you want to do it from a job, you can try to find ways to earn more money from your job. Maybe you work for a raise, you work for a promotion, maybe you work to get some more hours, maybe you work to do more at your job, that way you can earn more money. Maybe you work to get a second job, that way now you can really work to earn more money today. And you don't have to do this permanently for the rest of your life because I call it the decade of sacrifice. The way that you build wealth is by owning assets, period. It's not by saving a lot of money because your savings are losing value to inflation and as soon as you start spending your savings, the savings amount decreases. It's not through your salary because if you break your leg and you can't go to work, well, you no longer get a salary. The way that you build wealth is by owning investments because these investments can continue to pay you even when you're not working. And as you see more inflation, that generally benefits investments. Now, if you see a recession, of course, investment values can go down, but that also creates good buying opportunities to own and buy more investments. So now, how do you get more investments? Well, you got to spend less or you got to earn more or both that we have more money to own these investments. And right now, if you're seeing what's going on with the cost of living, well, people need more money to survive. Now, how do you build your own wealth? Because you can't just spend all of your money and not 
put money away to build your wealth, even if the cost of things are rising, right? People are looking at what's happening right now. They're saying, oh my God, if student loans have to start again and I have to pay more money to my student loans, I'm not going to be able to invest my money anymore. You cannot make that sacrifice. You still have to continue building your wealth no matter what's happening in the outside world, which means you're going to have to figure out either A, how do you spend less money, or B, how do you earn more money, or C, how do you spend less and earn more money that we have our money to invest, period. If you want to build wealth, you will have to do that because nobody else is going to do it for you. I hate to break it to you, but Social Security is not going to be enough for you to retire. And your 401k is not enough for you to retire. Even the founder of the 401k has come up publicly and said that the 401k has gone awry because so many people are relying solely on the 401k to retire. And it was never intended to be your sole retirement plan, which means you're going to have to invest more money, period. That is your way out. You got to spend less. You got to stop playing the spending game of financing the brand new car. You got to stop playing the spending game of constantly having the new Gucci. You got to stop playing the spending game of having the nice stuff right now. So you have more money to invest and also work to earn more money. That way you can go out and invest more aggressively. So now how do you earn more money? Back to the original question, because if things continue to go down the path that we've been seeing happen the last number of decades, how can you access more money? We talked about how to do it from a job. If it's not from a job, look for ways to earn money outside of a job. And the internet has made this so much more accessible, not easier, but accessible than ever before. Because now on the internet, the name of the game is attention. If you can grasp somebody's attention on the internet, maybe it's with a blog that you write. Maybe it's with a newsletter that you create. Maybe it's with your Instagram page. Maybe it's with a TikTok page. Maybe it's with a podcast that you start. Maybe it's with a YouTube channel. Maybe it's with something else. If you can grasp somebody's attention on the internet, you can then make money on the internet. Attention is the new currency on the internet, and the way you get paid now is by monetizing the attention. Now, the simplest way to monetize the attention is with advertisements, right? If you have videos on YouTube, you have a podcast out there, you're going to be able to have advertisements on your content and you can generate money. If it's not through advertisements. You can also sell somebody else's products. So you don't have to build your own business. This is called affiliates where other businesses will pay you for promoting their stuff, or you can build your own product. You can sell your own service. Maybe you have a service. You have a bookkeeping service that you can offer. You have an accounting service. You can do uh, digital marketing for somebody. You can do graphic design for somebody. You can do writing for somebody. You can do the legal work for somebody. You can do some sort of health consulting for somebody. If you have a service, you can offer that that now to people who are watching, listening to, or reading your stuff. Because when you have somebody's attention, you can offer your product. You see me doing this all the time. I have a company called Briefs Media. One of the products that we have in Briefs Media is Market Briefs. Market Briefs is my free financial newsletter, where it's a way for me to keep regular investors up to date on what's happening in the financial news. It goes out six days a week. We have a team that's breaking down what's happening, things in the housing market, the stock market, the crypto market, the global economy, and our own economy into this fun, witty, and easy-to-read email, and it's completely free to you. And the way that we monetize market briefs is we sell advertisements in market briefs. This allows us to keep the newsletter free, but I have this attention on the internet. People watch my videos, and then I'm able to market and get promotion and exposure for market briefs. Now, if you want to join Market Briefs, you can go to briefs.co slash market briefs. That's briefs.co slash market briefs. And I also got the link for you down in the description below. But this is where now the question is, once you grasp somebody's attention, how do you monetize? And that's the easy part. You do not have to know how you're going to monetize when you start, but you have to get started because the reality is things are not going to go back to how they were in the early 1970s. Things are going to continue going down this direction. Things are going to continue getting more expensive. Sure, we might see periods of deflation. That's what happens sometimes when you see recessions. But then after that recession is over, the deflationary period ends and you see inflation kick back up. So you have to understand that if we continue to see the housing costs rise, if we continue to see the price of cars rise, if we continue to see the price of phones rise, if we continue to see the price of groceries rise, what are you going to do? How are you going to earn more money? And it's better for you to ask yourself this question sooner rather than later because it gives you more time to work towards it. It gives you more time to ask that question of what are you going to do and think about it. And this is why I keep saying, 
that the best investment that you can make right now is by canceling your Netflix subscription. Not so you can save $15 a month, but you so you can save two to three hours of your time every single day. That way you can reallocate this time to number one, learning about how you can earn more money. There's tons of videos on YouTube. There's tons of blogs on the internet. There's tons of people on the internet teaching this for free. And then you spend your time doing try things. That is the best education. Then of course, once you start doing things, invest in your own education, buy classes, buy coaching, buy that stuff, because it will teach you lessons. Just don't get into all the gimmicky, hypey stuff. Learn lessons from people that are actually doing what they teach, but invest in yourself. And number one, it starts by learning. Then you got to do, then you got to fail. Then you got to keep learning and doing more. That's how you will learn but you have to get started. Listen, I had no idea that I was going to have a YouTube channel that has over a million subscribers on it. That was never my intention or my thought when I first got started, but I stayed consistent with my content year after year after year. I've been on YouTube for a long time. Look at my early videos. My videos sucked, but I learned and I improved. And that's what allowed me to build this platform, this minority mindset platform, which then became a funnel for businesses like Briefs Media. So this is where now, if you want to be able to earn more money, you can't just copy what anybody else does because it's too late for that, but you can learn and apply because the reality is you're going to need more money to number one, fund your lifestyle, and then number two, to continue to be able to invest and build your wealth because the last thing that you want to see happen is then you start sacrificing your opportunity to become wealthy because you just want to keep funding your lifestyle. Do not let that happen. We're seeing that happen everywhere. Use this as an opportunity to start learning, to start earning. That way you can continue building your wealth because that wealth is what's going to give you the opportunity to fund your family the way that you want. It's going to give you the ability to help your community the way that you want. And it's going to give you that financial freedom to fund your lifestyle the way that you want. We talk about building a business that's scalable. I've talked about that many times where you want to build something that can grow, that doesn't necessarily need you. That's the definition of scalability, that it can grow and it doesn't necessarily need you to grow. But if you want that business to be able to grow and not need you to grow, you have to do things that can't grow. The C 